So I'm pretty much a young feller as far as a lot of people are concerned here. It's all right. I have to tell you though, I got the haircut. And as it's getting cut, like, I don't know what it is about a fresh haircut. And my wife is just, she's going at it like, like, like I did something to her, right? Like she's just angry. And she's cutting it. And as she's cutting it and just the layers are coming away, the only thing she has to say is not like, not like, it's looking good, honey. It's looking good. Thank you for trusting me to do this and blah, 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 blah. Here's what comes out of her mouth. Wow. <laughs> You're getting gray. <laughs> so that's nice. But I'm still considered pretty young by a lot of people, and that's fine. That's fine. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not upset about it. Because of that, cool things happened. There was a funeral yesterday, and when I met with the family um, at hospice, um, when, when Virgil had passed away, I actually had a hard time convincing people that I was older than 23 years old. And I said, I don't know, you know, I'm a pastor, right? You don't just get out of high school and fill out a job application to be a pastor and see if you get hired. That's not quite how it works. But still, I'm not so young that I don't have a great appreciation for a lot of, a lot of like comedy acts from what might be considered before my time. Not necessarily before I was born, but when I was so young that I shouldn't have known who these people were. And, and one duo that I, was, that I always just thought was really funny were uh, Tommy and Dickie Smothers. Like, I, I just, I like that brand of, of comedy. And uh, a number of years ago, they did a routine on their variety show, and it, and it went a little like this. Dickie asked, what's wrong, Tommy? You seem despondent. Tommy replied, I am. I'm worried about the state of American society. Dickie said, well, what bothers you about it? Are you worried about poverty and hunger? No, that really doesn't bother me too much. I see, well, are you concerned about the possibility of war? No, I don't pay too much worry to that either. Well, are you upset over the use of drugs by the youth of the... Of America is not nah, that doesn't really bother me either looking puzzled Dickie asked well Tommy if you're not bothered by poverty hunger war or drugs what exactly are you worried about and Tommy replied I'm worried about all the apathy <laughs> really <laughs> like everybody know what apathy means <laughs> That you don't care about nothing. Well, it's not my joke is the thing, so whatever. <laughs> don't like it. Apathy is a problem that we have in our society for sure, but this world is pretty passionate about a lot of things. The passion we have for sports in our society has made many people quite wealthy. Whether it's college basketball's March Madness or the World Series or the Super Bowl, people watch the games, they jump up and down on the couch, they scream and yell at the television sets and sports bars, and they're, oh, everybody's got their colors on, you know? And they're going to watch the game, like somehow that's going to help or something. I don't know. There are some diehard fans, extremely diehard fans, most of the time men, who do things like, show up to these outdoor stadiums in sub-zero weather and take their shirts off, paint their whole bodies, and stand up and down over and over again, making all sorts of things, numbers painted on their chest to their favorite players. And that's kind of crazy. Passionate nonetheless. We believe that healthy marriages involve passion. A good salesman is awful, often passionate when they're, when they're making a big sale. People can be passionate about their hobbies and leisure activities. From playing golf to hunting and fishing or, or whatever else. People vote for passionate politicians. And they follow passionate leaders. 
We are all attracted to people who are passionate. Things that make us feel that passion. We, we're drawn to that. So what happens when we attach the word passionate to the word worship? I'm not exactly sure that mainline Christians in this country are known for being all that passionate on Sunday mornings. I mean, what does that even mean? Passionate worship. There's a guy that's kind of got a read on that. His name is Isaiah. And he comes face to face with it uh, in this morning's scripture reading, which is Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. The Bible reads, In the year that King Uzziah died, I also... I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this hath touched my lips. This, has, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away. And thy sin purged. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. It's the word of God for the people of God. Now this isn't the first time that we've looked at this passage. In fact, this passage is the foundation for the order by which we worship each Sunday morning. But we get a little more from this passage than, than just a framework or an itinerary. We get to see that Isaiah understands a thing or two about worship when this is all said and done. Hopefully by the end of today we're going to take a little bit of that with us. First and foremost, it must be understood that worship is about seeing the Lord. It isn't something that's done out of habit. It isn't something we do to put a check mark in the grandma box. It's not a performance. It's not about fellowship. The fact of the matter is it really honestly has nothing to do with us whatsoever. Worship is an encounter with God. And passionate worship is the kind of worship that takes us to a new place where we can see God differently. differently than we've ever seen God before. The problem is that this type of worship can't really be described. Isaiah has done the best he could to portray the experience he had that day. His words come out of like apocalyptic literature. You know, words that say, look, I don't know how to describe this. This is beyond anything that, that I could ever say. So let me give it a shot and try and put some words together to make you understand how powerful of a moment this was in my life. The thing is, when we're talking about cases like this, words never seem to do justice. Isaiah sees angels. He sees the temple filled with smoke. He sees God in a way that he had never seen God before. In this passage, Isaiah is saying, I had a passionate encounter with the Lord in the temple, and it made a difference in my life. Something else we need to understand is that the worship is a voluntary choice that we make. Like God doesn't say to us, all right, everybody, Sunday morning, get in that church. That's not how it works. God leaves it to us it leaves it to us because that's part of our free will. He wants us to choose him, not force us. 
When we worship, we're making that choice out of a sense of gratitude and thanksgiving for the privilege and honor that we have to actually worship God. We worship because we know that we are in the presence of God. We come to worship expecting to encounter God. Now, don't raise your hand or nothing. How many of us in here walked in here today expecting to encounter God? Like having that be our expectation as soon as we walk through the door. How many came for any other reason? Like I said, that's an individual thing. You know, that's a, that's a choice we make. You don't have to share it. But you do need to ask yourself that question. Like, why did I walk in here? Did I walk in here because I knew I'd be in trouble with my parents if I didn't come? Did I think I'd be in trouble with my wife? Maybe you thought you'd be in trouble with your husband. What are we expecting when we come into worship? Do we come looking for God? Seeking to discover? <laughs> like it kind of seems that it's our choice. But I'd like to think that some of us are on the right track already. And what I mean by that is that while it's our choice, it's the grace of God that motivates us to want to come here. God motivates us to worship. Another thing that we have to do is when we walk through these doors and we step in here, we need to center ourselves down and focus on the real reasons that we're here, on our purpose in worship. It's real easy to get bogged down with everything. You know, somebody asked me, like, like what, you, know, you know, sometimes churches have board meetings after church. Ah, I don't want anybody thinking about business when they're here. That shouldn't be a distraction whatsoever. Like thinking about like, oh, we got to talk about that thing later after church. And uh-uh. No. We should be clearing our minds of that completely. We should be clearing our minds of things that were said at board meetings. Like none of that should be any kind of, none of that should take up any space whatsoever in our heads. When we come to worship, We are a community of faith. We are in the presence of Almighty God. It's like that sense of, of awe and wonder, right? Like when you're like when you're in a big city. Like I don't care who you are, unless like you live there, right? But, like, you find yourself walking down the streets of Chicago or something, and you're just like, wow. Like, it's nothing but big, huge buildings on both sides of the street that seem to go up forever. Like, you can't do it now, but, you know, back when the Twin Towers, you know, pre-9-11 days, you could stand between those two. And they seem to go up so high that they, they seem to, the illusion is that they meet. And you can't see the sky between the two of them. Like, that was crazy. You look up and say, oh my gosh, how did, they, how did they build something like that? Or maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's something different. Maybe it's not the size of something like that, but maybe it's like a, like you go to like a like a cathedral or a 
our uh, a church. There's a church in Bay City that we that we drive by every once in a while if we go out there. I don't know what it is. Like I couldn't even tell you. I know it's not a Methodist church. That's all I know because I'd remember that. Um, but we pass by, and I, I say to Emily, Emily, look at that. Look how pretty that church is. It's so completely ornate. Like, how could somebody do that? Or even natural signs, right? Well, I'm going to tell you what. Y'all, I hope you all are not desensitized to this because the thumb area is one of the most beautiful areas that I've ever lived in. Or in which I have ever lived. Tracy, I'm sorry. That's just bad grammar on my part. <laughs> You should never end a sentence with a preposition. It's Bush League. (laughs) Oh, I'm getting lost. There's a a sense of awe when you experience that beauty. And maybe, maybe it's an individual that evokes that kind of awe. Maybe it's a like a famous person. When you see him, you get starstruck for whatever reason. Or maybe every once in a while, it's just that kind of person that has just this personality where they're just so confident and so sure of themselves. They walk in and they just come, their presence is just commanding. And you're like, whoo, I ought to be best friends with that guy. I don't know anything about him, but that guy is cool. And if some of that can rub off on me, awesome. People can give us a sense of awe and wonder. Now take all those things and put them all together. All the feelings you've ever had about structures, about nature, about about people. You wrap them all together and it shouldn't even come close to the awe, wonder, wonder the reverence, adoration that we experience when we worship together. When we're all completely sold out to the idea of giving our unrestricted worship to God. When we center and focus on who God is in our lives, just like Isaiah did, we can't even begin to tell somebody What's happening to us in worship? They just got to come be a part of it. They got to come see for themselves. That's why centering in worship is not only an individual thing, it's a community thing. It's a place where we gather together so God can hear us as one voice. That's why we're the body of Christ. We're not the, we're not the earlobe and the pinky toe and the elbow of Christ. And then everybody else just kind of phoned it in that day. That's not how it works. There's a sense of togetherness, a sense of unity that God creates among us when we worship together. And it moves us to a place where our worship becomes so much more powerful. It becomes passionate. And that changes us. Like, look what happened to Isaiah. Isaiah basically says, I saw the Lord differently than I have ever seen him before. And because of that, Isaiah begins to see himself differently too. (laughs) Isaiah's like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. I've seen God, and now I see myself for what I really am. I'm a sinful person. I'm a person of unclean lips, and all I do is hang out with unclean lip chuckleheads. It's a sense of who he is versus who God is. And that's revealed to him through that passionate worship experience. But here's what's awesome. Okay? Isaiah doesn't make a mad dash to the altar 
grab them tongs and stick a hot coal in his mouth. That's not how this works. He's standing there with his head hung down. Shameful. I'm doomed. There is no hope for me whatsoever. And God sends a seraphim to place that hot coal on the very lips that just admitted how sinful they were. Isaiah's purged not because of anything that he did, but his sin is purged because of the grace of God. Passionate worship leads us not only to see God, but also to see ourselves. And then when we see ourselves for who we are, it's not over. Because God swoops in and he changes us. We talk about... We, we, I mean... Like, like, we're always like, you know, and, and I, I do this. I do this. You probably heard this from me. Oh, Lord, we give thanks for the fact that we're in a country that we have the freedom to, to you know, to, to worship and blah, blah, blah. Other places can't. And, and, and we take that for granted because here's the thing. We have that freedom. And while all these other people in other countries are worshiping together in secret, we can worship like maniacs and take it out into the street, right? We have that privilege. We can leave here talking about like, you should come to my church. And let me tell you why. Because there is not a more passionate group of believers that want nothing more on a Sunday morning to just lift their hands, lift their voices, and praise God Almighty for everything that they are worth. That's the freedom that we have in this country. Like, we don't have the freedom to just, like, build a church and go there every Sunday. That's not what it's about. That's not what it's about. That awesome opportunity in worship gives us the chance to be so close to God that God comes and touches us with grace. And we know that that happens. We know because we've changed. We're different. And not because we came in here for a, for a what's in it for me kind of thing. But because we encountered Father God Almighty. It doesn't stop there though. We serve a God who says, all right, I've got some things that I need done in my kingdom. I need somebody to go. Who am I going to ask to go? The same prophet Isaiah, who just two verses before was saying that he was doomed and that he was in big trouble and what an awful person he was, stands up on his own two feet, face to face with God and says, here am I. Send me. Isaiah went from one who had an encounter with God and realized his sinful nature to one standing firm saying, here am I, send me. Look at the change that occurred in him. All because of passionate worship. The change that happened to Isaiah in worship wasn't for Isaiah. It was for what God could do through Isaiah. By sending him out to those sinful people he had lived among to tell them about the experience that he had had with God. See, what the church offers to the world in worship every Sunday morning cannot be had anywhere else. You can't get it at the beach. You can't get it at the golf course or while hunting and fishing. And I know that we like to say a lot of things. We like to say a lot of things. And I've done it too. I'll tell you what, man. Sitting in a deer blind, complete solitude, all quiet. 
that's a real nice time that God and I have together. But I won't dishonor the act of worship by saying that that's a substitute for it because it's not. I'm not worshiping God when I'm sitting in the blind. That's not what we're doing. When we're having quiet moments, we're not worshiping God. You know, you, you can't get it in those places. You can't get it. You can't get it sitting home on a Sunday morning with a cup of coffee and a newspaper with the television on some T.D. Jakes or Creflo. Give me a dollar. Or Smiley Joel Osteen. You, just, you can't. You can't. It's different. It's different than what we have here. The good news of Jesus makes all the difference in the world. And we believers need to offer ourselves wholly and completely to God on Sunday mornings. And the truth is, whether we sing hymns or whether we've got some, some contemporary praise music, whether we lift our songs with the accompaniment of a piano or a full-blown blown praise band, it makes no difference. Now, I know that when I said those things just now, that some of you were in here, and when I said hymns and piano, you went, yes. And another group of people in here went, oh. And on the flip side, that same group of people, when I said praise band and contemporary praise music, they were like, yeah. And the other people were like, nope. No, thank you. When we give a gift to somebody, don't we give what they want rather than what we like? We don't sing songs for us. We sing them for God. Our worship shouldn't be self-centered in any way, shape, or form. And, and don't misunderstand because I'm sure there are people, not everybody, but I'm sure there are people that would be like, I'm sure I'm glad the pastor told those other people that like that kind of music what's what. No, I was probably talking to you, actually, if that's what you're thinking. <laughs> And it falls on both sides. I'm not going to tell you what kind I prefer. I, maybe a little from here, maybe a little from here. I like some of that contemporary stuff. But my favorite song is not a contemporary piece. Not at all. It's one of them old school hymns I grew up singing. But either way, it doesn't matter. What's important is that our worship needs to be done in deep gratitude toward God in such a way that no one's ever going to leave the sanctuary. Whether they're old school or new school, they should never leave the sanctuary going, meh. They should leave the sanctuary grateful for the opportunity to worship. Worship is the encounter we have with God and the consequences that result from that encounter. When we worship passionately, we see and understand who God is differently than we ever have before. We open ourselves up to God, discovering in the process that, that God is opening us. We allow ourselves to be open and we see differently. We see the needs of our neighbors differently. We see the world and the needs of the world differently. When we see differently, we worship passionately. And it stirs our very souls. We encounter God and come to know just how much God loves us. And then we wait to see what God is going to do in our lives.